Hey folks, Tim Hewson, technical service representative from the Midwest and Northeast US for Syngenta Professional Solutions here. Uh, gonna be presenting to you guys today on spiders uh, and best management practices for their control. Um, oftentimes, you know, we get into we get into situations where we're dealing with spiders uh, in structures, around structures, uh, in areas of public use uh, where spiders just aren't really wanted. Uh, spiders are actually really scary. Um, so oftentimes I change the title here from they're really not that bad to they're really scary. Um, because they, they can drive a, a, an instance of fear into folks. But when we, when we come back to the original title, they're really not that bad. Uh, spiders are actually a very healthy component of a, of a, of an established ecosystem. Uh, they're part of the food chain, uh, to a healthy ecosystem. Uh, so it's really important that we remember oftentimes spiders, they're really not that bad, but yes, they can be really scary. Uh, spiders are, are part of the, the structural pest management uh, industry of, of target pests, right? And there's a survey that comes out every year called the Specialty Consultants Report. Uh, they track uh, industry trends, uh, revenue, profitability in, in the structural pest management industry. Uh, it's about an $11 billion industry of which spiders are estimated. This is some, some graphic from the 2020 State of the Ant Control Market Survey that was published in Pest Control Technology Magazine, but spiders were estimated to be about 13% of that total revenue. Not, so that's about $1.3 billion is, is geared towards spiders, managing spiders in and around uh, residential or commercial structures. Uh, so that makes them a number three revenue pest behind ants and behind rodents. Uh, termites themselves are their are their own, uh, so to say, market. Uh, here they're 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 established to be the same as spiders, but in the general pest control sense, uh, they're they're kind of in a different revenue market. Uh, but so really a number three revenue pest uh, in our industry. Oftentimes though, uh, that number three revenue pest doesn't mean they're a number three profitability pest, right? So we have to have revenue turning into profit in our industry for, for things to keep working, for the, for the wheels to keep spinning on the trucks, for the services to keep going and the lights to keep coming on. Uh, spiders can be a really challenging pest, right? Uh, oftentimes you can set the right level of expectation for an ant, right? If I come and do an ant control service around your home or around your, your commercial structure uh, and I, I set the right expectation, you may see some ants in the next few days as this continues to work, right? Ants are small. Oftentimes they're just a nuisance, right? A customer can accept that. If it's a spider, and it's and it's spinning visually displeasing webs, or now there's bugs, other bugs getting caught in the webs of an entry point at a very high end commercial account or at a residential account where there's you know they're they're sensitive and they don't want to see that. Uh, that that's very important, right? That you're going to get called back. You're going to have a reservice for that. If it's a giant hunting spider, right, a hairy wolf spider that could have a hundred little spider babies spiderlings sitting on the back of that pregnant mother spider and they they come into their garage or their basement and they see that thing they're not going to be accepting of hey you might continue to see these coming around right there's a fear that it might bite you you will be hurt right spiders have venom right oftentimes spiders every spider has venom but you, you know we often think that it's one of those venoms that's going to send us to the hospital Right. When when in actuality, most spider venom will not do that. Right. But all of those things are working against us when we're trying to make this a profitable pest. Right. I always say humans are 90 percent water, basically cucumbers with anxiety. You could call them 100 percent cucumbers with anxiety uh, when it comes to spiders versus those other high revenue pests. Right. And the spiders can't help but notice you spend a lot more time at home also. Right. With the way the, the, the world has been. Uh, I personally work from home, right? So uh, I'm not alone, especially, I mean, I know that the companies are trying to push their way back in towards um, having employees return to office uh, right now, but it's still a driving trend that since the coronavirus pandemic, we spend more time at home, right? In that instance, we actually notice things happening in and around our home more often, right? If there are spiders present, we're going to see them. 
right? And if you, if it's a customer that's paid for pest control service and spiders are a covered pest on that agreement, you're going to have an upset customer, right? Sometimes customers, this is my, my number one angry customer. I call her Mrs. Smith, right? But if Mrs. Smith is, is, a, is a paying customer of Tim's pest control, uh, and she has spiders still, or she's seeing spider webs, new spider webs, or new ground crawling spiders coming in and around her house, she's going to ask me what she's paying for, right? And and you get to the point where enough reservices are happening from your initial service that she wants to drop you as a customer, right? If Mrs. Smith gets to this point, uh, odds are that she's talked to the next door app or she's in a Facebook group for her, you know, subdivision. Um, people talk these days. We live in an interconnected world. Um, I always say that that one bad reservice or one bad customer actually is about six or seven potential customers that are impacted just by word of mouth alone. Right. If, if you get to a person that's reached this point, odds are she does not want to recommend you or your service uh, to a friend of hers. So always remember that. Right. Uh, we have to be setting and managing customer expectations, even with spiders, which I said are one of the toughest pests to do that. Right. We have to be educating uh, the customer on how or what. Why is the spider there in the first point? Right. Why are they there? Where did you see them? Where are they coming from? Where are they going? What can you do? What can I do? Right. These are important questions. And we'll talk more about these as we relate our way through the talk today. Uh, what should they expect to see after you've done something around the home? Uh, what should I do if more spiders come back? Right. The, the, these are the messages we have to leave behind as part of a spider management program. Uh, and of course, if I'm not telling them when I'm coming back uh, next to, to do a service or, or, or when I'll be back to do something next about their problem, I've really not set the right expectation uh, for that customer. And I'm not setting myself up for success against the most challenging of pests in, in that revenue graphic that we saw earlier. Uh, so spiders, um, they are beneficial predators. If you look closely at that picture of that wolf spider or that huntsman spider right there, that's a ground crawling predatory spider. It's eating a filth fly, right? So a spider that caught a fly on the ground when the fly landed, the spider caught it with its petty palps and its legs and is ingesting that. It's eating other pests, eating other insects, eating other spiders, right? So let's remember that spiders do have a healthy role in the ecosystem, right? There's over 40,000 species of them with about 3,400 located in North America. Uh, there's about 110 different little groupings uh, of species. These are called families of spiders. Uh, they're evolutionarily ancient. Um, some spiders, especially females of some spiders can live for more than 10 years. Uh, they're related to other arachnids. So that would be ticks, mites, scorpions, or, or pseudoscorpions. Spiders are not like insects in a lot of ways, right? So all those other revenue producing pests other than the, the mammals, of course, the, the rodents or the wildlife, um, you know, were insects. Uh, spiders don't have antennae. Antennae are kind of the nose of the insect or how they oftentimes see and interpret the world through smell. Uh, spiders don't have that. Uh, they are arthropods. That's, that's the closest relationship uh, to an insect. Uh, but they have insects have three body regions. Spiders have two body regions. So spiders have that what's called a cephalothorax. That's just a head and the thorax. If you think about the thorax on a bug, go back to fourth grade when you had to draw out the body sections of a grasshopper. You had the head, thorax, abdomen. The thorax is where the legs and the wings attach to an insect. Uh, no different spiders. They just have a fused head and that next section fused together and the legs are attached to the cephalothorax. Uh, and then they have another section after that, the abdomen. Uh, they all have eight legs. That's, that's an arachnid, right? Four pairs of two legs each, eight legs. They have two chelicera, or this is that's just a nerd term for fangs, right? All spiders have fangs. They have palps. This, consider these palps to be like the, the antenna of an insect. That's their major sensory organs uh, used for both prey detection, mate finding, all kinds of, you know, biosensory effects of, of for that spider in its environment. 
Uh, most spiders have a constricted waist and narrow waist where those two sections meet. They all live on land, of course. They're all carnivores, predators. 99.8% uh, of them are beneficial. Uh, we'll talk more about these web builders and hunting. That's just two groups of spiders, uh, broad groups of how we can divide them and, and their interaction with us uh, around structures uh, in, when we're trying to control them. Uh, females lay eggs and wrap the eggs in a sack. Oftentimes, this sack can be held within the spider until the spider actually looks like it's giving birth to live live spiderlings or live babies. Like I said, when I mentioned that wolf spider where the spiderlings might crawl up on top of that mom and it looks like there's a hundred little babies crawling around on top of a big giant spider, nothing will scare my wife worse than that. Um, but some of them actually leave the egg sac in, in certain areas that could be in the window sill of a, of a basement window around doors, window frames on, on the, on the ground floor of structures. Eggs typically hatch based on conditions. If it's uh, warm and humid, it could be anywhere from one week. If it's cold and dry, it could be up to eight months. Uh, once those eggs hatch, the spiderlings stay clustered. Sometimes they'll stay on the mom. Sometimes they'll just stay clustered in and around where that egg sac was. As those grow, they'll molt anywhere or shed their skin and grow anywhere from four to 12 times. As soon as they're big enough to start eating their own food, they'll disperse, right? Uh, they become sexually mature in several months. Uh, some, the typical lifespan of, of most spiders in the United States is about one to two years. Uh, some spiders have incredible book lungs or, or they're able to just basically seal their body up and hold the oxygen that they've breathed in, in, and they can survive long times, even survive fumigations. There's been document, documented evidence of spiders surviving fumigations, uh, in areas. So that's just a picture of those silken eggs, each silken egg sac. So all spiders, even ones that don't spin webs, produce silk. And they do that to, to, to wrap their eggs in, right? Uh, some spiders, the web building spiders, also use a different form of silk to spin the web that actually catches their food, right? But each of those egg cases right there of this house or cellar spider uh, is going to contain hundreds of eggs. Uh, that when they grow to a big enough size in there, they will shake open that egg case and hundred, a hundred spiderlings will come crawling out of each one of those egg sacs. Uh, a healthy female leading to producing a bunch of egg sacs like this uh, could produce large populations of spiders within a structure easily within uh, less than a year's time. Um, so remember spiders can be friends or foes. Um, this big wolf spider, hairy, hairy, scary looking wolf spider with those boxing glove petty palps coming down from the head. The, the four pairs of legs there, bigger than a quarter, right? About a 50 cent piece here. Uh, if this is outside your home, it's killing a lot of other spiders and a lot of, you know, big, big crawling cockroaches, crickets, earwigs, millipedes. Uh, roly polies, anything that you don't want coming inside that structure, it's killing a lot of those things. But the moment it's crawling around on the floor or crawling into one of your shoes and it crawls out and it scares you or bites you, right? You're going to feel that bite. Even if the venom doesn't come out of it, you're going to feel the bite of that spider and it's going to be painful, right? Arachnids can look really bizarre also. Uh, they have all different shapes, all different sizes. Um, there's actually hundreds of species of spider that actually look like ants. Ants are one of the only other predators that are even an, a higher apex level predator than a spider, right? But there's hundreds of different types of spiders that basically have evolutionarily grown to look and resemble an ant uh, to, so that they're not preyed upon either by other ants or by other spiders. Huntsman spiders, this is one that people often misidentify, or harvestman spider, not even a spider. I shouldn't even say the word spider at the end of that. Uh, it's actually a completely different group than the spiders. Uh, this is the typical daddy long leg, because I always just put this picture in there. Not a spider, a different type of arthropod, right? Um, has you know, what's the what's the urban myth about that? Has the has the the worst venom of of all these types of organisms, but doesn't have the mouth parts to to puncture through our skin. A lot of spiders have that. Once again, daddy long legs, not a spider. Very common around structures. Oftentimes misidentified as spiders. Uh, here's an easy picture of one you don't want in your home. Right, a tarantula that was actually caught in a home in Arizona. Uh, if you have that in your house. 
you get scared. If you're paying for pest control, you're asking why it's in there at all, right? So coming back to it, spiders can be scary. They are friends and they are foes. So there's there's an actual condition, right? That all of us are very familiar with, popularized by the the movie Arachnophobia and in, in the 1980s, starring John Goodman, right, as as the world's best exterminator who who tries to spray everything and kill every spider there, but but is missing the big, you know, of course Brazilian spider that was brought in. I don't know if it was from Brazil or not, but brought in that that big foreign spider that escaped from the lab and then was causing all the problems in the movie. Um, but there's an actual condition, right? A pathological fear or loathing of spiders. Uh, it's ingrained in our brain, right? Things look foreign. Things look scary. They make us scared. Uh, spiders, certain types of spiders are, have been used in interrogations of of, of you know, people that need to be interrogated uh cockroaches are another one that are used in those things it's the same in, innate uh fear right of of an organism i mean you get things like this this was not from the u.s but the guy couldn't access the meter the the the, the gas meter reading because the massive spider was attached to the box and it had red fangs he he went as far as saying what time what color the fangs were and why it was scaring them Right. Every year, every every year in, in, in the United States, you can go on to, to Google and type in a uh, spider accident. Right. Or, or something along those lines. Uh, this was an actual picture pulled from from a Google st uh, a web story out of Florida where a person was driving their car and they had they had a, a yellow sack spider, which is, you know, one of the most creative common names any entomologist has ever put forth or arachnologist has ever put forth for an organism. It's those little yellow spiders where the, the abdomen actually looks like a little yellow bubble or a little yellow sack. So they just called it the yellow sack spider. But one of those little web spinning spiders was coming down right in front of the, the steering wheel. And, and the woman that was driving was swatting at it and swatting at it while she's driving. And it just kept coming down and it wouldn't stop. And instead of stopping her car, getting out, finding a, a newspaper or finding something and walk, bashing away the spider or knocking down the web and, and killing it, she decided it was better off and best for her safety to jump out of the still moving car. And then her car slammed into a telephone pole. I wish I was making this stuff up. Right, but there are stories like this every day. Uh, here's you know, a video. Sometimes we do stories and say they, and we tell you don't try this at home. And I don't think we have to tell you this, but really don't <laughs> try this at home. I wouldn't try a it. A Fresno at home. man nearly burned down his house overnight trying to kill spiders. Yeah, the man was using a blowtorch. That blowtorch blow started a fire. The fire spread to the garage and then into the 4,000 square foot house. Firefighters did save the home, house. but the damage, as you can see, was pretty extensive. Firefighters saved the home, but the damage was pretty extensive. And there were still spiders in that house, I guarantee. And there were still spiders living all over the outside of the landscape vegetation and possibly on the structure itself, up on the eaves and soffit of that roof line. So this is how scary spiders can really be, right? To to folks out there uh, in the world where the spider is that bad and the pathological fear is that bad that that they get to that point. Um, so back to spiders, right? Uh, they have those petty palps and those chelicera here on this wolf spider, huntsman spider. You can see that the, the, the chelicera, the fangs pointing down, the palps on the outside of that, those are the sensory organs. Um, then you see the cephalothorax and the abdomen there on the picture on the right. Uh, spy, all spiders, the majority have eight eyes, right? And the majority don't see that well. Uh, vision is not important for web building spiders at all, really. They basically live in a two square foot area from where they build their web, right, as adults. And they really don't need to see that well. Hunting spiders that are crawling on the ground and actively hunting prey, they need to have much better vision, right? So they have different co different compound eyes than than the, the than the spiders that are building webs do. Uh, the one spider that has six eyes that's really relevant, uh, depending on where you're at in the US, is the recluse spiders or the brown recluse spider specifically. A spider that's venom can cause necrotic lesions or cause your skin to kind of, or, you know, your tissue to kind of rot and waste away if you don't seek medical attention for that venom uh, on the skin. Or even when you're seeking medical attention, you, you need 
uh, abrupt, you know, medical, acute medical attention uh, for that spider bite. But that spider has six eyes. Oftentimes, that's the easiest way for me to tell somebody if it's a brown recluse spider or not is they send me a picture where I can actually see the eyes or they send me a glue board or some monitoring board or something like that with a spider on it. And I can put it under a, a hand lens or a dissecting scope or something like that and quickly look at the eyes and be like, nope, there's eight eyes. It's not a not a brown recluse spider. And if that's all the further it needs to be, I can throw that glue board away then, right? Um, but once again, that eye number and that pattern of the eyes helps helps tell you what type of spider you're dealing with. So they most have eight eyes, but they have them in different orientations, right? Something as simple as that can help oftentimes set a level of expectation with the customer that you know what you're talking about, right? If you're, if you're trying to manage spiders around someone's home, you can quickly tell them what it's not and what it is. You, know, I mean, you might not know what it is, but you can tell them what it's not. Right. It's not one of these spiders with bad venom. Right. That you can tell that. And oftentimes you can do that just by looking at the eyes of the spider. Uh, you can look at the fangs. If you can hold a hand lens to it or the one's caught on a glue board, you can look at the fangs. This is kind of if you were playing who wants to be a millionaire with spiders, this would be your 50 50. Uh, so primitive spiders that have those have those fangs that were coming down. In between the petty palps, uh, those are going to be megalomorphic spiders, and modern spiders are going to be araniomorphic spiders. Araniomorphic spiders kind of cross like your hedge trimmers, right? Uh, but the, the the serrated edges of those fangs actually cross over each other and cross down and in front of each other uh, when the spider has their mouth parts resting down like that. Um, once again, head, thorax, that's the cephalothorax. The abdomen controls all of the all of the actual innards, right? The heart, the intestines, uh, the reproductive structures, all of those silk glands, right? To spin silk for both your egg case or for your uh, web comes out of those the silk glands, which leads to that spinneret at the at the very tail end of the the abdomen. Uh, the the glands in the front and those mouth parts that's going to be your venom glands, right? This graphic right here, I always leave it in there because it still says poison gland right there in green. The the green structure coming down says poison gland. It's always important to remember, and if you want to tell somebody who's asking you questions about spiders ever that poison is the band on the left right and venom is the terror the the movie that i don't know much about the sci-fi movie on the right and those are not the same things right so there is a huge difference between poisons and venoms poisons and venoms are two distinctly different things poisonous animals give off toxins which are absorbed when they are touched or eaten so think of a, a frog if you touch the skin of certain frogs in the rainforest or in australia they have poison on the outside of them think of poison ivy think of poison oak right if you're if you're hiking or you're you're down in some thick vegetation and you're you're not wearing long pants and you get that you touch those plants onto your skin there's an, a reaction with your skin where the poison is the toxin is absorbed through your skin just by touch venom must be injected right a snake that bites you a scorpion that stings you uh, a bee wasp a yellow jacket that stings you, a spider that bites you, right, must inject that venom into you. So those are two very different things. I, as me as an entomologist, I, I have had hundreds of instances where people are asking me in person or sending me pictures of different parts of their body, asking me what kind of bite is this. I never suggest you ever if you're in the business of doing pest control, right, or, or managing spiders uh, around someone's home, I never suggest you try to answer them at all when they're showing you a bite. They should contact an actual medical doctor. They should contact a dermatologist, right? They would know more about the skin reaction of whatever is causing that. It could be from a bite. Right. Unless you're finding active evidence of a certain type of spider all around the area where they're being bitten, where they think they're being bitten, or you're finding some other biting insect like fleas or bed bugs or something along those lines, and you can tie those two together very quickly, 
than possibly. But oftentimes, if they're if you're not finding something and they're asking you what type of bite this is, you either turn and run or you don't. You know, nobody wants to turn and run from a customer, but you turn and give them a card or or make a recommendation to to someone else in a university extension type role or service that can then get that person in contact with with medical actual medical analysis of what's going on there. Uh, so medical issues is one of those things that that really make people freak out about spiders. Uh, there's 50 species in the U.S. capable of biting humans, like actually piercing and you feel that bite, uh, but only about six species account for most of those bites. 80% 80, 80 of sus suspected spider bites are from other causes, uh, phobias, or you, you have an issue on your skin and then you itch it, right? Uh, and then you create a bacterial infection or some other type of infection around that skin irritation or what you thought was a bite, then it becomes infected, then that becomes the issue. Uh, several species can produce those necrotic bites, uh, brown recluse being the, the main one that we think of. Uh, that's one type of recluse spider. Uh, so ID is critical on, on most spiders, especially if you think there's some sort of medis medical issue, right? Finding a spider in the first place and then knowing what type of spider that is. Uh, really, when it comes to managing customer expectation, if they have spiders in homes, uh, this is oftentimes any type of spider they may think is one of those bad medical type spiders. So really having something in the back of your mind, this is just a simple list of, of something I created, but having your own list of how you talk to someone that's dealing with a spider issue, whether they're, whether they're actively really, really concerned about it, or they understand it's just a ho-hum, that's a type of spider. But if they don't want to have interactions with this, these are simple behavioral things that someone can do to, to make themselves less conducive or less prone to an interaction with a spider, right? And none of these involve chemicals. All of these are just behaviors that that person can do. There, you could make more if you really critically analyze this situation of how do I avoid an interaction with a spider? You could come up with an even bigger list than those listed here. Uh, so those recluse spiders, like I said, uh, they are a type of spider that can cause a necrotic lesion uh, when they do bite. Uh, the brown recluse, that's going to be reclusa or the big giant red circle. That is its home range. I have personally done pest control from Portland, Maine to uh, all the way down into the Carolinas. And I have had people with brown recluse spiders uh, in their attics, in their crawl spaces. Inherently, some of these folks moved into places that might have already had them. Uh, but if they are over there on the East Coast, they were most likely moved there. <laughs> by someone that lived in the middle area there, the, the home base range of the, the native range of the brown recluse spider. Uh, you know, I, I went to school at the University of Nebraska uh, there in Lincoln. We were right on that top edge of that spider. Uh, there were hundreds of apartment buildings and, and structures that I went to uh, in, in Lincoln, Nebraska there where you could, you could easily find brown recluse spiders in the basements. There were not tons of brown recluse spider bites. There was not tons of interaction with them. As their name implies, they're reclusive. They don't want to be found, right? It's only when we, when they, when one of them moves up into our area and we have an interaction with it that shouldn't be happening, that we have an issue, right? But so they can be found in those areas of white or other areas, uh, but oftentimes that's because someone has moved them to those areas, right? The the brown recluse spider. Uh, oftentimes it's called the fiddleback spider because if you look closely above the eyes, it kind of looks like a violin or a fiddle. Uh, I've seen, I've had brown recluse spiders come to me and I could not see that fiddle at all when I'm looking at it under a microscope, let alone just with my eyes. Uh, but once again, if you see those only three groups of eyes, there's two eyes in each group, that's six eyes. I can see it from here. If you if you know what to look for, you know the eye pattern of that of that type of spider, and very few spiders have that eye pattern. Six eyes, uh, black widow spider is another spider that if it if it bites you, the the venom. This is a neurotoxic venom. Recluse spider was a necrotic venom, so it kind of rotted the tissue. This is a actually attacks your neurons uh, type venom. Black widow spiders. 
Uh, it's kind of a myth, you know, that they say the that the black widow spider eats their mate every time after mating. Uh, there was actually a scientific study done and the black widow spider that we have or the brown widow spider, which is even more common and also venomous, like a little less toxic neurotoxic venom, but all the more more common. I would find a lot more brown recluse spiders when I was looking at exterior rodent bait stations or, or something like that. Uh, uh, irrigation boxes things like that throughout the southeast very common to see brown recluse spiders even black black i mean black brown widow spiders and uh black widow spiders but brown, brown widow was much more common um but the scientific study said that the black widow spider that we have here in the u.s actually eats its mate about 20 to 30 percent of the time the other time the male gets away there is an actual species of widow spider from south america where the female eats her mate every single time so be happy about that, that we don't have those spiders because when she eats her mate, that just gives her a lot more food right away to produce even more eggs. So she's much more proliferous. And, you know, then the more eggs you have, the more babies you have, and then the more uh, black widow spiders you have around an area. So our black widow spiders actually have to work for their food uh, initially after mating to, to, make an, to make an egg case usually. So we have those two types of spiders, two, two important groups. Um, the web builders, uh, those could be your orb, your funnel, your sheet, or irregular web building spiders, your grass spiders. Once again, poor eyesight, mostly live in a two square foot box around where you're seeing that web. These are the most common pest control targeted spiders. They're the ones on the structure. Uh, whether that be someone's residence or whether that be right on the, the door frames of your commercial structure, where uh, right behind this door is a production facility for, for some type of food or some type of drug or something like that. And they can have zero, zero tolerance for spiders right behind that door. Yet there's a door and a light and, a, and it's attracting a bunch of bugs. So why wouldn't a web building spider build a web there, right? Oftentimes we get in our common sense, we get in our own way of common sense. Uh, when we're designing buildings, but that's a topic for another day. Um, these these web building spiders are managed with low volume crack and crevice applications to the harborages near the web. We'll talk about what that means here in a second. Uh, hunting spiders, these are active and passive hunting spiders. There are two types. We're not going to really differentiate them. Uh, passive hunting spiders basically just sit and wait and then pounce on something like a jumping spider or a grass spider or something like that, a jumping spider really. And then other bigger hunting spiders, those wolf spiders, the huntsman spiders, they actually are active and move around and seek out. They're active predators uh, of other things. Uh, they have good eyesight high, and can be highly mobile. These are much harder for pest management professionals to control. We'll talk about ways you can do this through exclusion, prey reduction, high volume liquid residual treatments. Uh, we'll go through each of those. Uh, so there are great resources out there. North Carolina State University is where I pulled these from, or actually this is from the Department of uh, Natural Resources in, in North Carolina, but a great resource on like oftentimes uh, you have these same spiders in your area, uh, but it, it basically doesn't make you have to get them under a microscope. It looks at what what different features of them, what the web looked like, what 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 colors are on the spider, right? And it, and it kind of guides you through a characteristic uh, key where you don't need to be an entomologist or an arachnologist to, to know what type of spider you're dealing with. Hunting spiders, same, they have that same thing. Where are you finding it? On a dwelling, near water, on ground, on a plant, big or small, what type of leaves? Then they kind of have a different breakdown for those jumping spiders, which are a, a different a passive hunting spider. Um, North Carolina State does have an excellent website. Uh, Dr. Matt Bertone uh, is the guy behind this website there in their entomology department, but they will they will allow you to submit pictures of spiders, and then someone from their entomology department will quickly answer whether or not you're dealing with a brown recluse spider or not, right? If you take a good enough picture, and these guys are really good at identifying whether or not it's a brown recluse from some really bad pictures, I'm sure. So web building spiders, uh, spider webs, that's one of the strongest natural materials known. It's five times stronger than steel and two times stronger than Kevlar if you get down to that macroscopic, microscopic level, right, at, at which spider web is spun, like the individual cells, right? It's used, in, it's been used in all kinds of things, gun sites, uh, it helped design the, the barriers around 
NASCAR racetracks, like it helped design the material that's in those safer barriers. Uh, there's sticky silk versus non-sticky silk. That's like your egg casing versus I want to catch everything that touches this. I want it to stick to it. Um, certain web building spiders, they'll actually, the females will spin the web and then a male that wants to mate with that female will come onto the web and actually like pluck it with their legs and like play a song. Like there's actual vibration and they, they can use their, their, their palps and sense the vibration. So think of it like a, like a first date song or a wedding song or something like that as a, a courtship or mating ritual. Uh, the webbing itself on the home, not so much the spiders, because oftentimes you don't even see the spiders, but you see the webs, right? That's the primary cause of customer complaints in pest control. One of the highest levels of complaints from all pest control service is I'm still seeing spider webs, right? Spiders also use that silk to move around. Uh, when instead of spinning a web, they'll just put out a little string of silk and the wind will catch them and they can move from one area to another. This could be from one house to the next house. This could be a city block. There's there's spiders after in, in island biogeography when a when a volcanic island erupts and plant seeds and things are being being blown over from the wind from some other island nearby. Spiders are one of the first things to recolonize things also because this this stuff can carry them the right wind patterns can carry them miles of distances right um so, so that silk actually helps them get around also so when we're managing the spider uh we have to be inspecting for spiders we have to focus on sanitation and exclusion right and when oftentimes we're these are your outdoor spiders or are there ways we can make the area less conducive you have to be looking at how you can make the area less conducive to spiders right if that means changing the type of lighting or changing the position of lighting for those web building spiders so that your your porch lights aren't directly on on the porch right next to your door right but now you could run an electrical line away from the house and put a pole up and put a light up 10 feet away the bugs will be attracted more towards that light 10 feet away from the doorway and then the spider might try to build a web 10 feet away from the the door on this pole but that's not on the house Right. The customer is going to be far less likely to to care about it and 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 see it even in that instance uh, when it's 10 feet away and it's not something they're walking by every day and looking at that door. Right. Sanitation. That could just mean how can I make the area less conducive to the prey of the insects? So if the insects are eating or living in an old stump or living in mulch that hasn't been turned over in years or other landscape features. Uh, there's water issues associated with the structure. Something is bringing other bugs towards that structure. Spiders will follow their prey and, and, and come to get it. Uh, you got to be able to inspect and look for them, especially inside. Uh, they will live in voids. Uh, wherever their prey is, if, wherever you're finding bugs, there's a good chance you can find a spider. You need to be using glue boards, uh, sticky traps, and leaving monitors as part of your spider management plan. Right, monitoring and looking for them, preventing them, preventing populations from establishing and building, right, before they actually become something, something reactive. So preventing rather than reacting. Uh, where you're putting those glue boards matters, right? Focus on the areas and the, if there's a subfloor or a crawl space or you have access to a sill plate where the spiders could be crawling up from, from some surface below, crawling up towards the living space. Uh, in attics, attics are not the easiest thing to access and not an area of safety, not easy to move around in. Um, so how and where you're accessing the attic to monitor for spiders up in that area uh, can be challenging. And oftentimes we get behind the eight ball because we haven't adequately monitored that attic. So if you're having recurring problems with spiders, uh, you might need to schedule an additional visit. You might need to schedule something additional to get up into that attic and figure out either A, a treatment plan up there, or B, how are we going to inspect and monitor for this space in a better way? I always take pictures of whatever I find on glue boards, especially if it's spider related, right? That picture could end up helping you uh, when when and if someone thinks they have a brown recluse problem and and it goes above and beyond where you're at and, and where you think it is. Uh, they always say, you know, can you can you hear pictures? Well, anybody that knows professional wrestling can hear this picture with me. I'm not going to do a really loud Ric Flair woo, but you all can in the audience. Um, 
but you certainly can uh, get a lot from a picture, right? You, you, your body can even derive its own senses of that picture. Uh, so always take pictures of sites or situations, especially if you're having a challenging problem. Uh, once again, sanitation, vacuuming. Don't leave dead bugs laying around. If you think, oh, it was killed with an insecticide, there'll be insecticide on that bug. If it's inside in a windowsill or in the in the crack and crevice or around the cove molding or a, a baseboard, don't leave it there for something to eat. Vacuum it up. Spiders love to eat dead things because then they don't have to fight them. They don't have to use their venom to kill them. They're already dead, right? Think of them as scavengers. Right. If it's a freshly dead bug, there's not going to be that much of an insecticide residue on there to repel or do deter anything, any of that spire, really. Uh, so vacuuming up dead things is going to be a key thing. Outside debris removal, leaf litter, reduce vegetation, move moisture away from the structure. All of that is just a prey reduction. If there's less food for them to eat outside, you will not have spiders in and around your structure. You you know you won't have if you you have you know, web building spiders like your garden spiders, um, that's going to be harder. There's a lot of bugs out in your garden, right? Uh, they may move towards structure, but people are planting gardens right up on their structures now, right? In the landscape bed is now a garden sometimes, uh, where you have big giant uh, garden spiders like this. Uh, your other house spiders, these are going to live uh, subfloors. Basements, uh, doors, windowsills. These are those irregular web building spiders. Oftentimes they look like they're sitting upside down on the web. If you actually see the adult spider on the web, it kind of crawls upside down looking on there or will hang upside down on that web. Uh, very common crab spiders, uh, things like that around the around the structure. Uh, we're dealing one with one. Uh, I know there's an invasive spider in, in areas of Georgia and the southeast, the Joro spider. Uh, orb weaver spiders. These are these are you know big, medium sized to big sized spiders, but they just spin massive amounts of webs on structures all around uh, landscaping. Uh, the long jawed orb weaver is a very common one around lakes, lake homes, uh, where I'm at, kind of in the Midwest, up towards the Great Lakes, uh, can become an incredible challenge. If if you don't want webbing all over this landscape material uh, around where you're at. Grass spiders, uh, funnel weaver spiders. Uh, there's a type of, of spider in the Pacific Northwest, the hobo spider. That's a type of grass spider. It was thought to be one of those highly venomous spiders, but research is showing more and more that it's not. But they'll build kind of that funnel looking web all right along the foundation of the home where you can you can see it looks almost like a funnel. And then the, the bugs, the crawling insects go down there and get stuck in there. And then the spider will come up the web. But when you have these, you'll just see hundreds of these little funnel webs all around the the uh, the landscape around a structure, uh, they like to build webs up in this weep screed or here. This, that's this weep screed here is uh, that gap or that space where this stucco is up against the foundation wall. You could think of it as the space where your vinyl siding comes down or your wood siding comes down over the over the foundation wall of your home. There's a gap up in there. Web building spiders will love to build webs up in there. That's where the crawling insects are oftentimes going to crawl from the ground right up onto that foundation. And if there's a gap coming up under that weep screed or under that vinyl siding, they'll get underneath there. Uh, you need to be inspecting, looking for these things. You need to be finding a way to treat up into that area if there are spiders up there. Uh, here's an easy example of, of spiders up on your, your eave or your soffit or your gutter here. And that cinch point of that of that guttering where one section of gutter meets another one right there onto the soffit of the home. There's web building all over on that. Most likely, once again, the spider's living two feet away from this web. If you look right there and you look off and you don't see the web building spider sitting on the web, it's really only there when there's food caught on it or it needs to mate. Right. That's the only time. Other than that, it hides out in those cracks and crevices here. It could be down underneath where that soffit is actually meeting the the wall of the home there. That's a large crack and crevice that you could treat within there. Or it could be on the pinch point of that of that guttering or that siding on the other side. Right. But those are the areas where you need to low pressure, fine pin stream, direct those liquid treatments. Uh, if you hit the spider with insecticide, odds are it's going to die. You do not need to broadcast a fan spray with a backpack sprayer uh, 10, 15 feet, 20 feet up into the air here in this instance. 
uh, that's you're probably not going to hit the spider anyways if it's hiding in a crack and crevice. Putting a residual treatment onto that web, uh, it doesn't really stick to the webbing that well. It doesn't really interact with the spider that well. Uh, you're probably not going to get that long of a residual kill. For web building spiders, you really either need to you need to focus your treatments if you're going to put a chemical treatment within a two feet square box, right? Any crack and crevice around that web. And then you really need to knock down the webs. Here you can see webbing egg casing on the underside of that fence on, on the cross two by four there on that top two by four crossing the top row of that fence uh, webbing there. Where's that spider hiding in a crack and crevice on where those boards are, are, are nailed together. Uh, that would kill the spider if you got a treatment up there and then you could knock down that webbing. Uh, treating furniture outside, remove the cushions, remove anything prone to human contact, easily do that. Remember to get the webs. The number one thing of any pest control service for spiders is really, for web building spiders, is cobweb removal. This is a customer service point. It's also how customers assess the efficacy of your program. How happy are they going to be, right? Um, sprays don't necessarily stick to the webbing. You can do this first, you can do this last. It doesn't matter to me if you do it last, you're going to get some possible insecticide residue on your on your web knockdown device. Uh, just remember that that's on there. Uh, so you're not exposing something when you don't mean to uh, to an insecticide, but you have to remove cobwebs. Hunting spiders, crab spiders, things like this big, hairy, spiny, scary looking crab spider crawls around on the ground, has good eyesight, hunts prey, jumping spiders, right? Family salticity. Very hairy, unique looking spiders, uh, ambush predators, really passive spiders, uh, wolf spiders, huntsman spiders. These are the ones that will literally scare your kids. They're so big, right? The crawling spider, you look at that spider foot, think of spiders, they kind of walk up. I know you can't really see me through my video, but they walk up on their tippy toes, right? Versus a cockroach or a bug walks and it has these pads on its feet and there's lots of surface contact on an insect foot. Spiders are on their tippy toes. You, they're really hard to absorb. Pesticides will absorb to their feet through contact, but they, their abdomens are raised. They don't necessarily groom themselves like a lot of bugs do, like ants or cockroaches, things like that do. Uh, and they don't have these pads, right? The pads on their feet. That's Think of that like I'm, I'm a cockroach. I'm walking around with six sponges on the bottom of my feet that every surface I touch, that sponge is going to pick up whatever was on it, right? Spiders don't have that, which makes chemical control, especially for these hunting spiders, a lot more challenging. You can do general treatments to reduce them, but really you're reducing their prey. You can do targeted treatments to treat them with different types of applicators. Granule insecticides. These are granules that you'll broadcast out. A granule insecticide must be watered in if you want it to work. It has to dissolve and release the active ingredient. But really, you're not killing the spider with that. You're just killing the prey of the spider and hoping that the spider goes away. Granular baits, you don't water those in. Those are broadcast granulars that you can spread out in an area. But once again, the spider itself is not eating that. You're just reducing the prey. So to kill the spiders themselves with liquid insecticides around a home, the hunting spider, uh, the irregular ground contact, you wanna increase the volume of your liquid treatment. You treat them directly with a backpack sprayer, power sprayer, however you can get insecticide to where they are right? Perimeter treatments to reduce prey. Syngenta, we have, a, we have a great product. I always ask people where you were on June 30th, 1994. Um, what was going on then? Tanya Harding was being banned by the International Figure Skating uh, Competition for the whole Nancy Kerrigan incident. Uh, OJ Simpson trial was starting. Uh, if I was in the room there with folks or, or, or in your room, some of you probably weren't born. Um, but me, I was in junior high. I had no idea I would be this cool giving a being invited by Heritage to give a webinar on spiders today. I wish I could still grow hair like that, but can't. Um, but what happened on June 30th, 1994? Demand CS, a power horse, workhorse, perimeter insecticide, was first registered by the Environmental Protection Agency. Here we are almost 30 years later, and it is still the number one structural perimeter, long-lasting 
uh, fast knockdown and long lasting perimeter insecticide around around a home. I'm not going to make this a giant infomercial uh, for Demand CS or why you should use Demand CS. I'm going to just touch and use it as an example uh, for your spider management program. But Demand CS itself, there's attributes to CS insecticides that help for spider control, that help reduce prey for long periods of time. You got to have some part of your active ingredient that's going to, you know, here are these pictures on the left, that's demand CS. There's all different types. This is why nobody's been able to copy us because it's proprietary to make those little those little balls that are protecting the active ingredient. Some of them are very small. Some of them are really big, right? The really small ones, if you hit a spider with that spray, that will quickly dissolve through the spider skin. It, get into the body of the spider and knock down that spider and kill that spider. These other bigger ones, those are going to stick on the surfaces and you're going to, it's going to stick to that surface for a long time. If I'm treating the mulch or the coming up the house or around the entry points, crack and crevice entry points around a, of a structure, that's going to stick to that surface for a long time. And it's going to knock down the prey insects that would come into that area. Right. Um, so it's important to have something that both knocks down the spider and then has long lasting prey reduction if you're going to treat around that house. Um, once again, particle size does matter. You need your product to stick around, right? And capsule size is important. You want things to last long, right? Up to 90 days on some target pests around structures of knockdown of that prey reduction. That's how we're getting rid of hunting spiders, prey reduction. If we can't treat the spider itself, we have to kill their prey and then they'll go away on their own. This is what that proprietary framework actually looks like when you get down. This is what those little balls look like in that scanning electron micrograph. When you get down small enough to them, this is the, the, the mesh that's holding the active ingredient and releasing it at different. Some of it releases very early. Some of it releases 30 days, 60 days, 90 days later. Right, it's finally releasing that active ingredient as it's wearing down from UV light and other sources of environmental degradation. But technologies like this don't come around that often, as I said. Here's some that was actually sprayed onto a surface and then picked up by brown recluse spiders. You can see the little micrographs of the balls picking it up on those tiny, small little hairs on the legs of that. Those will quickly dissolve into that spider causing a knockdown and a death. Not all formulations of encapsulated products are the same. Some don't last as long. Uh, the top one is a generic, or the, the, the top one is an agricultural version of our same active ingredient. The middle one is a competitive product with our same active ingredient. The bottom one is, is our product holding up under different environmental conditions over time. Right, you need product that's gonna sit on your surface. Read your labels on your mix rates on a product. They are all different. Right. I suggest using lower volumes and lower concentrations and higher volumes if I'm doing a power spray or a backpack spray around a structure to either target the spider or target the prey. Right. Easy example of that at Syngenta, we do these things called application academies or field training. Or if you go to our SyngentaPMP.com, that's SyngentaPMP.com, there are all kinds of videos highlighting this very thing I'm going to be talking about briefly today. But this would be an example of the low concentration, low dilution rate, high volume treatment technique. But we set up these examples where here's a, here's a, a box and we're going to put a substrate on here where we put pine straw in this instance on top of that. And those cards that you see, the little yellow cards, those are water sensitive paper cards, right? So if a treatment makes it through all of that surface substrate, right? The, the mulch, think of it as bark mulch, think of it as pine straw, think of it as hay, think of it as leaf litter, whatever you're treating around a structure where the prey of the spider are and where the spiders are going to be, and you need product to get to, you need it to get through all of that material. I always ask folks, if I buy two yards of mulch and put it around my house, do I take away the old two yards that were put down or do I just throw it on top? 99% of homeowners are, are, are you know, environmental environmental uh, people at commercial structures put the old stuff on top because it costs extra to take away the stuff that was already there and you don't want to pay for that so you've just created a deeper and deeper layer of this organic matter where all the all the bugs and all the spider prey are all living underneath that they're not up on top of the surface right so you need product to get down there especially for your hunting spiders especially if you're trying to reduce the prey
So you pile six to 12 inches of, of pine straw on top of these cards. You then do a treatment. On the treatment on the left, you actually gave it 0.06%. So that's a high dilution rate of demand CS at two gallons per thousand square feet, right? So you treated that left side, high dilution rate, low volume. And, and you see the cards there, they got a little damp. They turn purple or blue when they get wet. They got a little damp. So some of your product got all the way to the bottom of that pine straw where, you, where all the bugs were, where your treatment really needed to get to. The treatment on the right, we actually cut the concentration in half, 0.03% demand at four gallons. So we doubled the volume. You're putting out the same amount of active ingredient in the same amount of space on each of these. And as you can see, so the treatment on the right, the cards there, they, they put out 0.03%, four gallons versus the treatment on the left, half that volume at double the concentration. And you can see the difference in those cards, right? It's very easy, very visual to know that you're getting liquid to pass through and get down to where those bugs actually are. You'll have a much bigger impact on any spiders that are actually down there because they will be touched by your actual liquid product being treated. And then you'll have a much larger impact on the crawling insects that are living down there, the prey of that bug, the prey of that spider, right? So high volume, low concentration, power treatments or backpack treatments around structures for crawling or hunting spiders versus targeted, uh, low pressure pin stream treatments of cracks and crevices where those web building spiders are. Never forget granule baits, granular baits. They do an excellent job of eliminating those feeder insects, cockroaches, crickets, earwigs. Use those around structures outside, possibly even away from the zones where you've done your, your power treatments or your high volume treatments. Work yourself away, work zones away from that structure to kind of be creating a, a zone or an, a zone approach of safety or protection of prey reduction all the way around that, that structure. Um, I know I feel like I've been talking for a long time. Um, I'm sure my hour's almost up. I would just I just want to thank Heritage again so much for the opportunity uh, to be invited to, to talk today. I know I'm going to be sticking around here for, for questions, or I've been answering questions, hopefully, as, as people are doing it. Uh, we can probably edit that part out, I hope, but <laughs> we'll be, I'll be around to answer questions. If you need to contact me in any way, my email is the best way to do that. That's at the bottom of that list there. That's Timothy. They don't let me use my short name, Timothy.husen, Timothy.husen at Syngenta.com. So once again, Thank you, Heritage, for the opportunity, and thank you all for, for tuning in.